Amen. Mark 11, 15 to 17, very quickly. Ask your neighbor, when was this last time you read the book of Mark? Don't let me lecture on you talking when I say you should talk. You know, the sermons will just be going longer. So did you get him? Do you get an answer? So the affairs are so that they will not ask them. Ask her when was the last time she read the book of Mark? Okay, ask them when was the last time you read the Bible? You have an answer. I love that. I love that. Mark 11, 15 to 17. Are you there? The theme of today's service is resurgence. Mark 11, 15 to 17, very quickly. So they came to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. What a powerful Jesus. That's like a munile who will not allow you to carry your goods into a place. Jesus was saying, it's my father's house. I own this place. Scripture says he will not allow thoroughfare for those who are selling wares. Then he taught saying to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it. Who made it? They have made it. Uh, I love the way you say it. You, say we, you didn't say we. You say they have made it. A den of thieves. For a few minutes this morning, I'll be sharing with you what I've titled the house of prayer. The house of prayer. Father, thank you because the entrance of the world will give light, give understanding to us simple people. As simple folks, we've come to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of the writer, and I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let the purpose of sending your word be fulfilled. We give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can have your seat in God's presence. Welcome to class. And in class, the teacher does as he pleases. So today, I will do as I please. For those of you who take sermon notes on your phones, the culture of this church changes from today. Even those of you who bring your Macs, iPads, Samsung, I can see you are rich. The Lord is blessing you. And I love that. But from today, please, when you come to church, come with a paper and with a pen. The Lord keep you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you. Can I have a believing amen? Amen. Because I can't trust you enough that your ex will not pop up. Your Facebook will not pop up. Your WhatsApp will not pop up. And then you say it's urgent. Two hours of not being available shouldn't kill anybody. Amen. All right, that aside. So the scriptures we read today, Mark 11, 15 to 17. I'm talking about the house of prayer. In our anchor passage, we saw the temple had become known for something that was outside the will and the intent of God. The temple had become a place of business exchange, buying and selling. Guru the change was in church. People were selling clothes, and people were selling stuffs. And Jesus was on the scene. And this was the first time, this was one of the few times in scriptures that we saw Jesus betray his emotion. And he became very angry. Angry at them for turning his house to a place that was outside of God's intent for, for, for the house of God. And something happened. When he said that, the Bible says he began to turn their tables around. Allow me to say to you that it was a sin you don't want to be a part of. The Bible itself calls it the zeal for God's house consuming. But I read, what I read, I didn't just see zeal. I saw anger demonstrated. I saw him 
do things. He wants an uncomely sight. It's not something you want to see. You want to see Jesus love you. You want to see Jesus peck you. I'm not sure anybody has ever prayed and said today, Jesus be angry with me. What you want to see is the loving of you, Jesus. But this time around, and in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that ulabalu, Jesus made a statement. And that statement keeps reverberating over generations and time. And what was that statement? He said, you have made my house. Even the house. He said, it's supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it the den of things. Perhaps if the Christ will walk into the church today, and in this church today, would he say we have made the house? His house, his father's house. Would he say we have made it a den of things? Would he say we have made it a place for the demonstration of clownish power and fake prophecy? Will he come and say we have made it the hub of fun and entertainment? Will he say we have made it a place of business connection? What will he say even about us? I hope today we will come to an understanding of what the church is supposed to be like. We could argue that what the people were doing at the temple was very important. And I will explain that to you. Are you following me? I will explain that to you. That, that's, that may be very important. Because there were Jewish people who were living in Greek places. That means they were living far. And according to the law of Moses, sometimes they cannot bring their tithes in plants, uh, in fruits, and in animals. So Moses encouraged them that if they were living so far, one of the things they could do is that they could sell it off with money and then bring the money to the temple of God. So perhaps you are living in the U.S. Uh, and then you sold it off for some dollars. Uh, and now you are at the temple in Nigeria. You have to exchange it for Naira because you can't use that money. So you can say, wow, what they were doing is also for the purpose of the kingdom. Is that not so? Uh, and then you could say also that after they have exchanged the money, they would also need to buy things to sacrifice to God. So you will need to buy birds, you will need to buy some cows, some cattle. And so you will say, this is important. This other church is supposed to work. They were helping the work. But Jesus said, what they have done is they have converted his house to a place of wealth. He was saying the primary intention of my house and my temple is that it's supposed to be the house of prayer. It's not supposed to be a place of exchange. And perhaps he was also right. Because you could have done all of those exchanges outside of the temple. Do you believe that? They could have had a place probably very close to the temple where they could do the exchange. Change the money from whatever they spend in Greece and change it to whatever they spent in Jerusalem. You can buy on the same streets, not on the temple, not inside the temple. Why would they do that? But you know, <laughs> the closer you are to where it is happening and where the need is, the more expensive it is. That's why shops around Tinubu Square is more expensive than when you go inside. Do you understand? Because the closer you are, people, so when they are in the temple, I'm sure they were also collecting money for them for being on that particular spot. People were making money from people coming to church. Have you had people who, when they want to see prophet, they pay? Yeah. Have you had that before? Say, ah, I got numbers. A, a, a woman, old woman was telling me how she went to see a pastor on the, on the mainland, a prophet on the mainland, because they are not called pastors. But you don't see pastors and pay. You have to have a good name. Or a, like apostle. Prophet. You understand? So that because who will pay a pastor to see a pastor? So that's why people like us who are genuine have to probably look at codifying the name. So you say super apostle, super prophet. You understand? So when they, she said, I got number 102. I said, wow. He said, I will pay 5,000 era each. I said, what are you looking for? He said, this, I'm praying for healing. Now, if we don't find healing in the real church, people will go to the fake places. Somebody listening to what I'm saying this morning. So Jesus was saying, and he was saying to them very clearly, and I want you to follow me very closely this morning. And Jesus was saying to them, you have turned my house to the house. Now, we can look at the life of the Christ. And through his life, we can tell what is the purpose of the church. Would you like to know what the purpose of the church is? Jesus did three things in the church. The first one is that he went to the church to worship. He went to the temple to worship. We come to church to worship God. To worship. 
Not to say the pastor, not because you love the pastor's suit or you love the pastor's shirt or you love his official eye carrying himself. The first purpose of the church is to worship. Therefore, before you leave your house, you must set yourself in the mood to worship God. You must get prepared to dance before the Lord. You don't get to church and start saying, are we dance? No, that's later. You, from the house, because that's the purpose of the temple. That's the purpose of the church. And then the second thing we find Jesus did uh, as it concerns the church of God, as it concerns the temple in those days, is that he went to the temple to learn and to teach the word. So the second purpose of the church is the word of God. It's the place for the word. I come to the church to learn and to teach the word. And then number three is that he went to the church, to the temple, to pray. And he showed us uh, in the scripture we started with in the book of Mark. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. God is jealous about his church. He is present as the builder. He is the head of the church. He is the Christ. Uh, he is so present in his church that he walks in the midst of his church. So that when you come to church, you have to honor God. Are you following what I'm saying? It's dishonor to be in church and to be online. By online, you think, I think you know what I mean. It's, it's dishonorable to be in church and be chatting with your girlfriend. It's dishonorable. Why? Because God is the head of his church. And I'll show you that from scriptures. The Bible says in Matthew 16 verse 18, Jesus himself was speaking. He said, I will build my church. Who is building? Is it PFA? Is he an apostle? He said, I will build my church. So God is present, active in the midst of his church, building it. That's number one. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, he is the head of the body, even the church. Christ is the head of the body. So that every church that Christ is not the head, that's not the church. That's a social gathering. Now you can see that there are many churches that you call churches, but they are social gatherings. And you know, you, if being in a, you know, a Bible teaching church is the hope of the body of Christ. Why? Because it will help you. It will help you so that you can guide you against error. Church is not just to have fun. It's so that you can be equipped and you can learn so that you can know what is true church and what is not true church. The fact that they have many people following them and they're on social media does not mean they are of God. The head of a true church is Christ. Are you following what I'm saying? And then the resurrected Christ, the Bible says in Revelation, so we begin to read from verse 1, from verses 12 to 20, the resurrected Christ showed a vision of himself uh, to a man by the name of John at the, well, at, at, the, at the island of Patmos. At the island of Patmos. And what did he show him? He saw Christ resurrected. He saw him wearing the robe. He saw him walking in the midst of a lamp. And when he explained that revelation, he said that those lambs, uh, lamp stands, uh, were the church. A true church, Christ walked in the midst of them. So as we are gathered here today, you are not gathered to hear me preach. Christ is in the midst of us. Praise God. Do you understand that? Christ is in the midst of us. So there is a pattern in the mind of God as it concerns a true church. Understand that? And that's why God is a God of pattern. After Moses saw the pattern of the temple on the mount, he admonished Moses to build according to the pattern. You must build according to pattern. Your life must be according to pattern. It's very important. So what is a true church? A true church is not just a place where they praise and you dance and you have fun. It's not just a place where the word of the Lord is taught. A true church is not just a place where you pray. A true church is a place where the thing is done. Praise, prayer, and the word of God. That's the issue I have with certain churches who they give like four hours in a five-hour service to prayers. And that's also the issue in the churches where they give only two minutes or one minute to prayer in an hour in service of two hours. Attention to God's word. Attention to prayer. And attention to praise and worship. You see people say, oh, 
Especially those of us who listen to the word a lot. What people? Why are they dancing like that? Why are they dancing like that? You know, you don't understand that the three has to come together for a proper church. Anyone who listens, reads the word, and understands the word will give praise to God. You understand that whatever you have become, it is by God. Even the revelation you had, it was him who opened the veil for you to see. If it didn't open, you will not see. Today, I want to emphasize on the prayer function of the church. The prayer function. So, I told us three functions of the church. Is that not so? Are you, are you with me? He will talk his class. Are you with me? Yes. You are writing with your hands. Your mouth must be involved. If not, you can slip off. Are you following what I'm saying? Or I tell them to turn off the AC. That one you will not sleep. Uh, you will not sleep. You will discover that the struggle will continue. Do whatever you have to do quick and come back. You are fighting sleep. I can see it already. Amen. 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 Glory to Jesus. The pastor is just, just saying the way it is today. I should be... <laughs> My wife is trying to scope me. I stay with the word and I stay the way I want to stay today. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, mm -hmm. When you read church history and you read scriptures, the book of Acts, you see that churches that changes history, that change history, while churches, teach, by that I mean churches that saw signs and wonders, churches that propagate the gospel, churches that were remarkable in their time, they were churches given to prayers. The prototype of a Christ-centered church is a praying church. If we do not pray, we are not patterned after the Christ. He is not a true believer who does not have a prayer life because your prayer life is the breath life of your spirit man. Your prayer life is the breath life of your spirit man. If you do not pray, you cannot be a good Christian. You will be a jaundiced Christian. <laughs> Have you seen children with jaundice? Big stomach, right? <laughs> Is it their eyes now? Their eyes. Yellow. Why? Because certain elements are missing. Certain elements are missing. They were a praying church. Listen, no church should be seen as a place of fun and entertainment. How bad we have gone. When they say I was church, they say, church was fun. We are not a zoological garden. How was church today? My God. If you see the way we dance, to God or to yourself. I was, I was, I was mightily entertained. Oh, so sweet. Now, don't forget that I said that Fun entertainment, like the other guys also needed to come to the temple to also do an exchange and all of that, can be part of the church, but it is not the main core of the church. But what we have done is that we have managed in our human way of wanting to be in front, to put our flesh in front of the spirit. So a description of a good service is how much fun you had. If you see the guest minister, hey, we scatter everywhere. In fact, somebody will say, scatter the floor before they even start singing. Is it bad? No. But that is not how we describe whether church was good. Because I assure you that no matter how much fun you have in church, there are places you can go to that you have more fun than that. Am I right? When you go to trans, go to an amusement park, I'm not sure we have a proper amusement park in the whole of Lagos. A proper one. I'm not sure. But if you, if you go to a proper amusement park, oh my God. The kind of fun you have is almost codeine induced fun. You would have gone through certain, I mean, if you go to certain parks that they have all these things that move around and all of that, the danger will make, even your heart will be beating fast, you'll be laughing like a <laughs> Why? The fear has induced it. Have you seen people who go and travel out of Nigeria and you see them inside those things that run? And they say, ah, 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 ah. Sometimes you think they have lost their mind. When they come down, they still tell them there's another one. They'll still go there. That kind of fun, nobody can guarantee that kind of fun in church. Nobody. The fun you have in church is the kind of fun that your head is still there. 
For this other one. Ah, uh-uh. we went to one. I said, Miami Ajala. Ah, uh, they said they wrote it. They say it is too late to call Mama. You know, if you go to this place, they will put stars there. This one was seven star. We went there. White men left like this. They, they saw it and they went back. When you go down, it will look like you are going to hit a rock. And then suddenly, just a minute for you, in seconds, you see, you just open up, boom, and then you enter. So, ha! And then, boom. The thing opened. After I left that place, I remember God has called me to the nations. The, the way my heart was palpitating. You know, we left. Yeah, we said, let's go. I said, I'm not going anywhere again. Hey, I just sat down. They were there. I was saying, Bravo. When we left the place, we were so happy. Aye. No church can guarantee that kind of fun. Why? Because the church is not the place for fun. We are not a zoo where you keep feeding a monkey. Boom, boom, boom. No. The primary purpose of the church is supposed to be a place where you are spiritually edified. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, my house shall be called the house of prayer. James chapter 5, verse 16. Elias was a man of like passion. Okay, no. That's what it is. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. That you may be, he said, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man. It makes a man's power available. The Bible says Peter was kept in prison. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. And the early church prayed for him without season. If somebody goes to prison here, we will send lawyers to go and see them. Am I? We'll send lawyers to go and see them. We will not try to raise prayer points. No. But when Peter was in prison, the early church prayed. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The early church gave themselves to prayers. To prayers. To doctrines of prayers. To prayers and doctrine. That's what they gave themselves to. What St. Taylor said in the way I love it. He says, since the days of Pentecost, as the old church ever put aside every other work and waited up for, for God for 10 days, that the Spirit's power might be manifested. Prayer is buried. And everyone weeps. If all of us pray, the wicked will flee in the midst of us. Evan Robert said. I love the way Chrysostom put it. He said, prayer is the fountain and the mother of a thousand blessings. Prayer is the fountain and the mother of a thousand blessings. Ian Bounds told us how to pray. He said, prayer is not lent in the classroom. Prayer is lent in the closet. In the closet, that's when you are. If you don't have a prayer room, you don't have a time to pray, you are not a serious believer. Listen to this. Watch my knee. That old, that man that suffered so much for the kingdom of Christ. Uh, he said, "Prayer is." Uh, he said, "When we pray, he said we lay the track that the power of the Lord uh, may run." And he said, "God's power is so irresistible, but God's power cannot run except we first of all lay the track. There needs to be a rail for God's power to move in." I love what Corrie Ten Boom, you must have heard me say this again and again. Corrie Ten Boom says, and I love it. He said, don't pray when you feel like it. He said, make an, make an appointment with God and keep it. He says, because men are powerful on their knees. Ian Bang said, talking to men on behalf of God is great. But talking to God on behalf of men is greater. Listen to this. Martin Luther. Martin Luther says something that is so remarkable. He said the men who have done great things for God were men who are great on their knees. You don't, you don't just think to be great. You don't think of revival. You don't meditate on these things. You have to be great on your knees. Find a man who is prayerful. Give me a church that is prayerful, I'll give you revival. Because revival is the resultant effect of a, of a people who are banking the doors of heaven. Who are saying, God, you will come. God, you will come. Let there be an outpouring of your spirit and your power even upon us. 
Chuck Smith says something I love. He said the most important thing in the life of a born-again Christian is to pray. It's not to dance. It's not to modulate. It's not to dress good. It's not to make money. Fools make money. I think there's a book, The Idiot Way of Making Money. It's not, so you don't have to really be wise. You don't have to know God. The most intelligent person in your class was he born again? Probably your manager does not even know God. Because the ways of the kingdom is not how we judge, it's not, it's not the ways of the world. The king of the systems of this world is the devil. He must elevate his people. He will be a bad devil if he cannot give money and he cannot give power. Who will follow him? If the devil can't give money and he can't give power, who will follow him? But he trades with power. That's his crypto. He trades with power. You want to run politics? They take you to a place and say, what will you do? What can you do to get to that position? Can you kill to get to that position? Slaughter this person and get this position. Say, no, Zia, you are not ready. I remember a friend was talking to me. I said, no, no, no. A brother in this church was speaking to me. And he was sharing how his father told him. He said, do you want to do policy? He said, yes. He said, there's only one advice I have for you. He said, if you can take 200 million naira and you can burn it, you strike it on fire, set it on fire, and then you turn away without crying. He said, then you are ready for politics. How many of you can do it? Same people. The money you made. You can't even burn 100,000 and, and walk away. You don't know the idea they are saying. You can spend 500 million on an election and still lose. That's what they are saying. A billionaire and still lose. And you must come out the second day and say, Thank you, my people, all of you volunteers. Thank you. You. You even lose 50,000 in business. Pastor is still canceling you. The devil is in the business. Of trading money and trading positions and trading power so that people can serve him. So the index of the kingdom cannot be the index of the world. Benz cannot be your index. Human hair cannot be your index. I'm not speaking of 25,000 hair human hair. Your index must be the index of the kingdom. Chuck's mates. That awesome man of God. He said, prayer does not change the promise of the purposes of God. He said, but prayer changes the actions of God. Do you want action in your life? Do you want to get to the arena of action? Then increase your time of prayers. We are not ready until we are ready to war. Today, the church has more people, but less prayerful people. A church is never more like the New Testament church, like in prayers. Listen, I would rather we all pray and we do nothing else. I would rather we give ourselves to prayers. The disciples, the apostles, they were involved in church administration and church management. And the time came, scripture says there was a battle, I believe this is Acts chapter 6. And there was an, it was a battle because the Christian Jews were complaining, their widows were complaining that they had been neglected in the tables. And he said to them, he said, look for you amongst yourselves, men who can be judge and lord over this matter, but we'll give ourselves to the study of the word and to prayers. But you have given yourself to the study of law. You've given yourself to the study of accounting, to business, and you have neglected the word and prayer. See, you know I'm not an apostle, but you're a disciple. True disciples pray. What is prayer? Can I define prayer for you? You know, the way we define prayer is that the way we define prayer is that prayer is communication with God. Have you heard that before? Raise your hand. Raise your raise your prayer is communication with God. Prayer is communication with God. Raise your hand. Hallelujah. Talk to God, God talk to you back. Hallelujah. 
valid. But that is arena of primary school. Are you following what I'm saying? Kindergarten knowledge. I can teach my daughter that prayer is talking to God. That's a, Daddy, what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God and you listening to him. It's communication. Ah, my daughter understands that. But you have left the school and you have not continued into maturity and into completion. You've not continued on the road that leads to Telios. That's why you are on the same thought. Let me give you a pray. Let me give you a definition of prayer that you should write closely. Why? Because prayer is more powerful than just communication. What is prayer? Prayer is the offering of spiritual sacrifice. Can you give me that slide so that they have it on the screen? Prayer is the offering of spiritual sacrifice to God. It is the meeting of spirit with spirit. So in that definition, you can see that your praise can be prayer. Do you see that? Because it's the offering of spiritual sacrifice. Your praise can be prayer. Your worship can be prayer. The meeting of spirit, spirit. Deep calling unto deep. It is the incense that rises from your altar to the heavens. You have an altar. The place you pray is your altar. There's a spiritual altar. And you are the priest of your altar. As the sacrifice goes up to God, it comes down in large-scale consequences. That's what prayer is. Bringing result and effect on the heart. Somebody say, where is that scripture from? Give me Revelation chapter 5 verse 8. Revelation chapter 5. And then verse 8. And then we read 8, 4 to 5. Look at that. Now when we are taking the scroll in the heavens, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having an app and golden bowls, which was what? Read with me. Which was what? One, two, three, go. Which was what? It was full of incense. How did they get incense in the heaven? The Bible says, which are the prayers of the saints? Rise, man of God. Begin to pray. Pray in the spirit. You can begin to pray. What you hear on the earth is this. But in the heavens, uh, there is a chemical, I won't call it a chemical. It's not a scientific process. It's a supernatural process that turns these tongues into incense in the heavens. Have you ever been to a Catholic church? A celestial church. Then you know what incense is. They take that thing and they begin to move around. And then it brings like smoke and it turns, it changes the fragrance of the atmosphere. So there is, your prayer is so important because it changes the fragrance in the atmosphere of heaven. Worship is not completed even in the heavens without your prayers. God needs men to pray in order to have incense. Scripture says, and the golden bowls, which were full of incense, which are the prayer of the saints. Is somebody getting this now? You see, it's more than just talking. You see that? Give me Revelation chapter 8. Now, I will tell you, you know, I told you, I said, and it comes on the earth with large-scale effects. 8, 4 to 5. The Bible says, and the smoke of the incense. You know what the incense is now? Do you know why it's this now? So when people preach stand and start bringing influence, incense, now you know what they are getting it from. It's not <laughs> because they are just trying to be like the pattern in the heavens, right? Um, I'm not going to talk about whether that's technically correct or not. Let's not go into that. Let's just keep with what we are saying. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it to the heart. So everything, that prayer brought an incense, brought the incense. They now took that thing, scripture says, and they threw it on the heart. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and earthquake. Have you heard the song by Dosi? First it was fragrance, then it turned to fire. My worship is my weapon. This, 
That's the scripture. Now you get it better. When you sing that song now, you sing your revelation. Before you just thought that man just wrote some things together. First, it was fragrance. That's why he said, prayer is spiritual sacrifice. It's an offering. I can worship God and it will be prayer. Are you following what I'm saying? It's not until I pray in tongues that I pray. Understanding that can be prayers. You understand what I'm saying? I can just be going on the road and say, God, you will do it. God, you will do it. God, you will do it. And that's sacrifice into the heavens. Somebody understand what I'm saying? Now, as I preach, if you want to pray in the spirit, it's okay to pray in the spirit. Just understand that it's important. Now, people, that's the definition of what we call spiritual prayers. That's spiritual prayers. That's how prophetic prayers are batted. You have to have an understanding that my prayer does not, nobody say my prayer does not go, your prayer does not go past the ceiling. Nonsense. My prayer, I, it's, the spirit of God is inside of me. It, it takes it and transports it to the heavens. They don't pray in heaven because they are seeing God. It's not needed. Why you pray? Because all things are done according to the will of God. So they don't need to pray. Prayer is important on the heart. When we all get to heaven, I will pray. I will be on my knees. But as far as I'm on the heart, I will be on my knees. Why? Because I would love to do something I won't be able to do in heaven. I'll be able to praise in heaven, but I won't be able to pray. I want to quickly, as I close, give you seven purposes. You say, I know people, I know my people, they know me ah, as I close. I want to give you the implications of a praying church. The implications of a praying church. What are the implications of a praying church? Number one, praying church births God's purposes on the heart. They birth God's purposes on the heart. First Timothy chapter 1 and then verse 18. A praying church birth God's purposes on the heart. Paul was writing to his son, Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, he said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which were previously made concerning you, that by them you may do what? Wage a good warfare. Listen to this. Prophecies may fail in your life if you do not fight for them. They might call you rich. In fact, when they came back to you, <laughs> the woman that took you said, Ah, this guy is Omogoyini. He's your son of destiny. And you go around and say, I am the Omogo. I am the Omogo. You will die as Ogo. The only way you can come to the reality of that destiny is to wage a good warfare. Paul said, We have prophecy had come. Do you have prophecies hanging over your head? The only way we can turn those prophecies to reality is by prayer. Church, God has called us as a territorial church. The only way we are going to take territories is through prayers. Through the instrumentality of prayers. Prayers. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Pray in this manner. Therefore pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Thy kingdom come. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He have to pray. God, Jesus was saying this is the manual of prayer. This is how to pray. That your will be done in my life, and on the earth, in the church, as is in heaven. The implication of a praying church is that they begin to see the realities, even of God's will in their life. Prayer is batting the will of God. Prayer is not an option for a purpose-driven believer. You have a purpose to live for, or more you've got to pray. <laughs> you've got to pray. Are we pray? Are we pray? Because if I don't pray, Satan, we may just stop, but may just. If you don't pray, you won't fulfill purpose. You will fulfill purpose. That is why many people, when they were in university, they had a purpose they were living for. And this is powerful. They had a purpose. They say, I'm going to achieve purpose. But when they get out of school, and then they get into life, they are now looking for what they will eat. They are forgotten purpose. So they don't even pray. They just become very anxious. They are just, they call themselves hustlers. We don't also we live a best life. What the devil does is that he makes you so busy 
that it takes away prayer from you. If it can take away the breath life from you, eventually you are going to die. Because the breath life has been taken away. So your purpose will suffocate and die. You need the life of prayer to feed your purpose. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Luke 18, 1, he said a parable. Jesus said a whole parable. To the end, intense purpose that men ought always to pray and not to pray, faint. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul said, pray without ceasing. When you stop, continue praying. When you stop, continue praying. Be in the atmosphere of prayer. Be a person given to prayers. A church that prays will see the fulfillment of God's plan in their personal life, in their generic life. God's purposes will be battered. If you want to see the manifestation of God's will and hand in your life, be a person of prayer. It's not pray today and not pray tomorrow. Prayer is consistency. You know, breathe in. Don't breathe out. How long can it stay like this? But that's what we do in the place of prayer. We take breathing once. We say, I prayed once on Monday. We don't pray again. I hope you have written out now. And don't, don't, don't continue. <laughs> Why? So prayer is how you breathe in and breathe out. How often do you breathe in and breathe out? Because it is needed for the bios life. I taught you about bios, which is the physical life. It is needed. Your spirit life, your numa life, what does he need? He needs prayers. Prayer is the breath life of your spirit. Is a breath life of your spirit. Prayer is not just communication. It's how I keep my body aglow. When we just got married, she's looking at me, what does he want to say again now? When we just got married, my wife said to me, so there are times that she just become um, touch and go, how do you call that? What's the English for that? You don't know. You just want me to say it the way it is. That means that she becomes very irritable. That's the word. She becomes very irritable. And then say one thing. Become irritable. So one day she told me, said, see, anytime I'm irritable like this, I've not been praying as I ought to. So when she becomes irritable, me too, I will not advise her. I think you should just go and pray. I think you should just go and pray. You know why? Because we do not respond. The way you respond to situations, you're not supposed to respond. You are supposed to determine situations. Therefore, it is not what you go through. It is what controls you on the inside. The thermostat and the thermometer. The thermostat regulates the temperature to what it wants. The thermometer tells you what the temperature is. Many of us are thermometers. If they bring it out, you serve it out for them. Especially in Lagos, no do yourself. No, no, no. Ah, hey, Emi Omeko, what are you talking about? You start going, you know. In Lagos, people just become taller. Have you discovered? So, see, you don't walk like this. You know, like the people will push you, they will cheat you. Can't you see? Can't you? you have said seven, he said one. But you see, when you are a thermostat, it's not a, you know how Yoruba people say it, I don't know where I woke up to see in the morning. That's why I'm behaving like this. Some of us who are married wake up to see one person in the morning. So I don't know how you people who are not married say it, I don't know why I woke up to see this, that's why I'm behaving this irrational. It's because the spirit has not entered into you. You are not living the spirit life. You are living the flesh life. You are Sakikos. Thank you. That's a good student. You are Sakikos. Those of you who don't know what Sakikos is, that's a teaching we did a while back. That means you're a carnal man. That's what Sakikos means. It's carnal believer. The carnal a man who lives by the flesh. And you see, that's the problem. When you marry as a Sakikos, it will be an issue. You cannot put salt, salt in a food, salt, just salt. Ah, she fed me. 
When you talk like that, how, why did you say, you know, as she said, you know what that means in English? No, sir. Miss it means Miss Mary. <laughs> it means Miss Mary. It means like, uh, uh, I don't miss Rodo. How do you, because of salt, tag a woman a mistake? But you're a Sakikos. Sakikos responds higher than the situation. Sakikos is, what did I say? What is your response? No, I won't do that. You translate that in your head. Number one. So what is, why do we pray? Number one, to bat God's purpose. Number two, to receive prophetic instruction. Right. You want to turn it to straight out of scriptures. <laughs> Jesus said, pray without ceasing. How often should you pray? As often as the Spirit pushes you to pray. But you should have a regular time when you pray. But how often do I pray? Sometimes I finish my prayers. And that's a long time to finish my prayer. And then I'm done. I say, I'm done. And then I'm just walking and then something just comes to my spirit. I want to address it. I have to address it. I pray again. So how often? That's why I say pray without sin. That means be in the attitude to always talk to your father. Be in the attitude to always change situation. Be in the attitude, number two, to always receive prophetic instructions. That's number two. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Somebody say, it's been a while God spoke to me. It's not that God does not want to speak. It's that you, are not, you don't have time for him. The number of time you have dedicated to streaming services. If you dedicate it to God, you will hear God more. I think you know what I mean by streaming services. Act 13, 2, the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord. Did he say as they prayed? He said, as they ministered to the Lord. That's why he said prayer is spiritual sacrifice. As they offered a spiritual sacrifice, whether that was in prayers, whether that was in worship, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit said, now, separate unto me, man of and God. You will receive divine instruction because you stay in his presence. Because you cannot hear my voice until you can be guaranteed of my presence. What guarantees you my voice is my presence. Is somebody following what I'm saying? Don't worry. If you have clothes outside, it's already, so just follow me. If this was a village now, when we're doing village outreach, we'll be saying, ah, I hope you don't have young flower outside. I hope you don't. But thank God you're in the city. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So follow me. Allow me to say to you that we live in times and seasons. And every season demands new instructions. New seasons demand new instructions. You cannot go into your tomorrow with yesterday's instructions. Every time you must hear, God, what are you saying in the now? Before you got married, there was something God was saying. Now that you are married, what is he saying? Before you got a job, there was something God was saying. That is why it becomes difficult for people to operate God's instruction in the former time, in new seasons. When you are unemployed, God told you to pray two hours every day. Now you are employed. I am wondering, where will I get it two hours from? I will still read the Bible. Where will I? Now, new instructions. New instructions. God told you before, wake up 4 o'clock, 3 a.m. every day and pray to me. You discover now that now that you are employed, 3 a.m. you are sleeping. Even when you wake up, you are half asleep, half praying. You don't know. You just call that alarm for six, just run. You say, I've been praying for three hours. They lie. You have been sleeping through. So a new season demands new instruction. It was at Bethel that Jacob's covenant was renewed. It was at the place of prayer that Paul and Barnabas' apostolic mandate was received. There is an instruction in the place of prayer for your new level. Stop trying to look for a prophet. Stop trying to look for a man. The next level instruction is in God's presence. If you can get into his presence, you can unlock your next level. And then number three. It is in the place of prayer number three that we obtain mighty deliverance. Many times by reducing prayers to only communion and communication with God, we reduce the potency and the import of prayers. For prayers help to bat great deliverances. In the Holy Church, Acts chapter 12, Herod had killed James. And when he saw that he pleases the Jews, let me not lie to you, there are people who it will be, they will be pleased that you failed. I said that to somebody again. 
There are people that will be pleased that you got pregnant without a husband. Amazing. He pleased the Jews that James was killed. There are people that will laugh and they will be very happy. In fact, you think they have just won Narabet. When they hear that you drop out of school, when they hear that you can't pay your house rent, there are people that will be happy. Don't think they will be sad. They will be happy, very happy. It serves him right. Bible says, when that happened, they began to pray. The church began to pray because he had proceeded to tell Peter, Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Bible says, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made. And in Acts chapter 16, 24 to 26, Paul and Silas were also in prison. They were locked in chains. Scripture says, and they began to worship. They began to pray. And as they pray, as they entered their offerings unto God, spiritual offerings unto God, she said there was an earthquake. If there was an earthquake, everywhere should shake. It was only the prison that shook. That tells you it's a supernatural act. And they are changed. Seriously, I am a student of geography. Earthquake does not lose in chain. Earthquake cannot lose in your chain. If, you, if there was an earthquake in Nigeria and you are seated like this or you are chained, when they find you under the rubble, you will still be with the chain. But there was an earthquake and the Bible says they still came into the prison. That means it was not an earthquake. It was probably a shaking, a tremor. But the tremor Caught their chains asunder. How? You think you are in chain to addiction? You think you are in chain to barrenness? You are in chain to stagnation? You can break through. If you have not broken through, it's because you have not prayed through. I love that generation of the millennials when we were camped out in the church. The thing they told us about prayer is push, pray until something happens. How do I know? Somebody say, How do I know God has answered? There is the answering by faith. And that's what a generation knows. <laughs> but my generation, we were not taught that by faith. We are taught that until we see results, it has not been answered. You know now, say, the Lord has answered. Believe by faith and confess and move on, move on. We did not move on. It was prayer of importunity. We kept on banging on the door until we see transformation. You are praying for your husband? I said, you believe it by faith, you walk on. My generation, until the guy comes and manifests in real time, not in my dream, in real time, not in visions, in real time, he has no answer. So every day we keep praying, go fast. You obtain mighty deliverance. Oh, there must be something that Prophet Obadiah knew. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17. He said, on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob shall possess their possession. In the place of prayer. Number four, very quickly. In prayers, there's an alignment to the will of God. Do you drive? When you drive, your car is supposed to go this way. But when you drive, your car is going like this. Misalignment. And that will destroy your tires. Destroy your car and cost you more in the long run. Many of us, our life is misaligned. It is only in prayers that you can be aligned to the will of God. Why? Because the will of God is not always automatic. What just happened? <sighs> Alignment. <laughs> ah, please, let us not be holding that family. My God. I just found out that. I was shouting. Now, because now I can, there's a feedback. I'm hearing myself now. I was any that noise before. Ah, misalignment. May your life not be noise. May you always hear what God is saying. You know, that's feedback. To, feed, to hear God speak to you again. The will of God is not always automatic. You need to pray for the will of God. And you need to be aligned. There are many people who know God's will for their life. And there are many people who knew God's will for their life, but they never saw it come to pass. They never saw it come to pass. If you will see it come to pass, there must be a fight of faith. There are a lot of things disturbing the performance of God's will. There are demonic activities that want to hinder you from God's plan and God's purposes for your life. The Bible says that the prophecy had come 
before Israel went to the second slavery, when the land needed its Sabbath because of their sin, Scripture told us that the prophecy had come that they were going to spend 70 years, seven Sabbaths the land will observe, 70 years in the wilderness. 70 years in the wilderness, in their place of their slavery. But Daniel saw something in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. That 70 years had come and the people were still in slavery. 70 years had come and there was no fulfillment of God's will. 70 years had come and things were not getting better. And Daniel began to fast and to pray. Listen, if there is a will of God for your life and it has not come to pass, I don't need to tell you to start fasting. You need to start fasting yourself. And say, no, I'll pick two days. It is what we call fighting for the prophetic word. You begin to fight. Because at a certain time, it is not just the, the, the demonic disturbance. It is also that you also are not aligned to the prophetic will of God for your life. And it is only in the place of prayer that you can receive instruction that will make you realign yourself to the will of God so that you can bat God's prophets for your life. Is somebody listening to me? Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who was one of you? Paul was reporting to the church. Say, Epaphras, which was one of you? He said, always pray that you will stand complete and perfect in all the will of God. That means you can stand in what is not the will of God. Colossians 4, 12. Colossians 4, 12. You can stand in what is not the will of God. You can marry what is not the will of God. You can get a job that is not the will of God. Number five, in order to create the world you envisage. Is there a word you saw some 10 years ago? You know what we do? We say, we always blame Nigeria for our life. Do you know that Nigeria is the quickest thing to blame? <laughs> it's Nigeria. How can I graduate and not find a job? It's Nigeria. It's not Nigeria. All over the world, people are not getting jobs in that course that you read. Short fire. <laughs> Any course that you are quoting for your project, you are quoting according to somebody in 1976, 1984, 1982. It is a dead course. The reason they are still doing it is that they can't sign those professors. It does not have relevance again. It's gone. So that certificate is gone. Reinvent yourself. Amen. It's not a sermon or reinvention. There's a word for you and me. A word of purpose and destiny. That word may not exist yet. But God has given you the power to ordain it by calling it forth in the place of prayer. If you pray, miracles will happen. If you pray, angels will be released and your word will be created. Hebrews 11, chapter 3, Hebrews 11 and then verse 3. The Bible says, For we know that the things which you see are not made by the, from the visible or from the invisible. How did God create the word? He spoke. Light. Me. That's how he spoke. You need to speak in the place of prayer and create the kind of word you want. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. For by faith we know that the things which are created. No, no. So why we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen? For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are internal. The KJV call it temporal. Actually, the original word there is the word transient, which means that word temporal is the word temporary, is the word transient. It means it's subject to change. Whatever you see in your life now is subject to change. It is changeable. It's changeable. Oh, I'm not married. It's changeable. Oh, I don't have a husband anymore. It's changeable. Subject to change. And then number six. I'm moving very fast now. Because I want to give you everything. Overcoming the endurance of the devil. It is true prayer that I can overcome the endurance of the devil. Prayer is the means by which you overcome the hindrances of the devil. That the devil is locking around your life is common knowledge. And that is using people, systems to hinder you, is also common knowledge. 
You can only win via prayers. When I was growing up in the city of Ibadan, there was a song that was so popular. I don't know whether you are old enough to know that song. But there was a song that used to be very popular those days. Very popular. It's a Yoruba song. Mi o te te mo ni le aye o. La ti ba e we ni ba ma ti mura sile. Mi ba ra bon e le no me fa. Mi ba re tu a tota. Mi ba lo li o ta mi la ti lo be e ni ja o. Ba ba o da kun o da bo. Mo ta mi o la ye. E le du mari. Aye mi do wo re o. That's the kind of song we grew up with. What do you grow up with? Congrats, Tungkwato. A generation is responsible for his own knowledge. But even as knowledgeable as that song seems to be, <laughs> that song says, I did not know for those who don't sign Yoruba. It means that if I'd known that this word is a word of battle, I, from a child and a toddler, I would have won a gun of six barrels. I would have gone to the house of my enemies and I would have shot him down. And he said, Lord, here's my prayer. Show me my enemies in this world. I had issues with that because there are lawyers and policemen around. So even if I had known who my enemy is and I've shot him, I've also acquired a problem for myself because they would have also put me in kirikiri. Are you following what I'm saying? Another thing he said is that, show me my enemies, oh God. If the Lord shows you your enemies, you may not live again. Because according to scriptures, the immense enemies are people of his own household. When the Lord shows you, and you now saw that your father is the one who has been using your destiny. <laughs> what am I trying to say? That the wisdom of God is that the battle is spiritual. It is not physical. We can't fight spiritual battles with physical weapons. That old mama that you don't greet is not a problem. Whether I greet her or not, if she's the one troubling you, she will keep troubling you. Right? It doesn't change anything. But spiritual battles are fought in the spiritual world. Somebody say you will not be promoted. You don't shout back. Shouting back may work at certain times, but it won't work. It's spiritual. Because the devil seeks to hinder us from progressing. That's his major work. He doesn't want you to accelerate. And I think I will show you this. Give me 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17 to 18. I want to show you something here. And if I hand there, I think it will be a good place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 to 18. It might be a good place to hand. Um, are we there? There's no need to be asking what's going on. I know what's going on. Please, can I have my phone? Somewhere, lecturers also look for what is lost, and I'll find it. Amen. Yesterday I was so tired that my head was not where my shoulder was. So that's what's going on. Give me First Thessalonians chapter two, not chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter two, and then seventeen to eighteen. Sorry for the break in transmission. Is it fine? Hallelujah. Are we there? But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, and David more eagerly to see your face with great desire. So, in that verse of scripture, Paul wanted to see their face. Is that clear? And he said, I desire it. I wanted it to happen. And he said in verse 18, therefore we wanted to come to you. Now, he was saying, it's not an ordinary person. It's the giant me. It's me. It's not somebody writing this letter. It's me. We wanted to come to you. Even I. 
all, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Are you for real? Satan can hinder Apostle Paul. Why are you right? <laughs> he said, Satan hindered us. And I hear people say, the devil has no power over the believer. The devil does not know the power of the believer. And I will show you what that word in that, what does it mean? That word in that is actually the word encopto in Greek. Don't worry. When you come to this church, eventually you will be able to speak some level of Greek. Encopto, which is spelled E G K O P T O. Encopto. What does it mean? It means to cut into, it means to impede one's course by cutting him off on his way. Did he show demon there? But what does demons, what do they do? Is that not exactly what they do? Now let me show you pictorially what that means. All right? Stand. All right. Stand up. You know they go for gym for nonsense. Stand up. All right. The light, stand. Stand, stand. We'll show this. This will be very interesting. Stand there. Stand beside him. The light come. Are you afraid? Fear no man. Stand. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And if I come, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Lord, you have been so good. You are so good to me. The Lord says to you, that is your seat. That is your seat. That seat is your place of destiny. Your place of glory. If you can sit on that chair, you are elevated. And God has given you a prophetic word. Yaakov That's your place. No, don't go. But that's your place of glory. Oh God, that's kingdom. That's your kingdom, oh. It must not pass. It must not pass. So hold each other's kobudok to bakonja. The devil tells his people. Now, so, as, and as he moves towards glory, towards his glory, he can see that his life is getting better. So he makes one step. His life is getting better. Can you see that? So that's the place of glory. He's still struggling here. So he take one step. He got a good job in Lagos. No, first of all, first step, he moved away from that place where he was, where there can never be a job, right? Like Tosin said. So he moved away. So first step. Then he got another step. He got a job, right? So he can see that, ah, as he moved forward, a lady is already liking her, him. She said, ah, Oluwami, Olorumio. He's already talking to a lady. See, there's now this contract that is chasing that contract, 700 million. It's on the place of glory. And God has told him that is it. Now, this part was clear. So you guys move a little like this. Move, move, move. So he can see it. Can you see the chair? Good. That is the place of glory. That's where you are going. But a gopto means that the devil has cut off that mark. This is a cutting off. This is a cutting off. So yeah, go. Go. For your place of glory. For your kingdom. 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 Now, now you see what's going on here. That is what you call containment. That's when you say there is a ceiling over your life. There is a containment over your life. See, ah, money, that's it. It's like nobody in their family can go behind that ceiling. That is a gopto. He has cut off from the place of glory. But you think, you think he has not done well, Abby? Tofet, you can even try. So you move, but there is a cutting off. Do you understand? 
This is what it means for the devil to hinder. Go again. <laughs> it, there is nothing. In fact, it gets to a point. You see that the way it went the first time is not the way it goes again. Because something happens to your mind after you have been contained for a while. You tell yourself, let me just try that job. Let me just try that contract. They will not give me. Why? Because it has become a ceiling over your life. That is the place where you are always cut off. So you say, if I apply for a job of 150, 100,000, they will take me. But you see this 401. <laughs> I've done it every time. In fact, last stage like this, they can even say the company, because of you, the company won't wrap up. Have you had that kind of level? Before? The company even folded up. No company again. See what's going on? A cupto. A, a cutting off. You can see the place of glory. If every time you dream, the vision consistently is that that's where you are working. But every time the place you walk is that you enter a shop. But the place you are supposed to walk is on the VI. You see it every time. Every time. But instead of your mates going like this, you are going this way. You know what that means? <laughs> You know that this is not the place. How can I be serving tables when they're supposed to be serving me? And you keep struggling. You know that ah, when it time 500k in the account, 500k in the account, somebody will fall sick. They will call you at home. The money will go down. You understand that? You go up again. You say, ah, now I can afford to leave this accommodation, this accommodation that is so terrible. Then you fall sick yourself. And then you spend all the money plus your savings on it. You say, it is not... Ah, it's a cost. It's not a cost. There's an ego talk. The only way you can let go of that hindrance is through prophetic prayers. The only way you can win that battle is through prayers. And I will tell you three things. Three things that will make him break out. Three things that will make him break free. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says, until his spirit come poured upon us, he pours his spirit. The Bible call it the spirit of the, the spirit of prayers of grace and of supplication. The spirit of grace and of supplication. It means that there is a God uh, who will now come upon you. See, I will pour on the house of David uh, the spirit of grace. Grace is the person of Christ. Uh, so he holds you and then you begin to pray. Your part is to pray. Jesus' hands is to hold you by the hand. Uh, and then you begin to pray. Vialo tabaria. And then he continues to pray. And then he goes and uses 1210 uh, of the book of Revelation. The Bible says, and they overcame him. How did they overcame him? Sorry, 12, 11, Revelation. So you say they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By whose blood? The blood of the person called grace. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, not counting their life even until death. Now he is afraid to break through because that impediment has affected his mind. Now he is afraid. But the Bible says, not counting their life unto death. So he goes by the power of the Spirit and say hi, and then he takes his seat. You see what's going on? You see what's going on? Even them and their life and their speaker, I say everything has, everything moves. But you know what you do? You are still cuddling the devil. Say, baby, you know I love you. <laughs> baby, you know you can go. You are doing cats, please. Some of you pray, say, Please, if you can help me, God, help me get to the next level and I will serve you. Please, Lord. Please, Lord. What who are you begging? By the blood of a lamp and the word of their testimony, not counting their life to death. How much do you want it? How much do you want transformation? How much do you want change? The house of prayers. How much do you want change? How much do you want it? I told somebody, and I keep telling these young people, if you marry at 40, you'll be a prayer point. You don't know what that means. It means your sons and daughters will be praying that you don't die so that they can continue to live their good life. Because if at 64, your, first, your second born is at Convenant University, if daddy dies, you draw and lost you need in here. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why one of the favorite prayers you can pray, satisfy me early, oh God. Satisfy me early, oh God. There is no joy. I've seen people who got married early and waited for 20 years to have their first child. And somebody has got married at 30 and have a child immediately. Eventually, did they not catch up and left them? He goped on. The devil hinders. Somebody say, does it mean we are demonized? I've shown you now. You see how it is. 
That's how the devil cut off even Paul on his path. It's called a gopto. Number four thing, how do I rebook? Number one, you rebook the devil in prayer. You don't say, I leave the devil alone, he leaves me alone. You call his name and say, you devil that hinders me from getting a job, from getting into a new level. Every demon that stops you from relation, relational satisfaction, every one that stops you from financial blessings, I take you out of the way. Everything that causes an addiction in my family, I curse you by the roots. And then number two, after rebooking the devil, what do you do, number two? You use the blood of Jesus. Sir. Oh, we overcame him by the blood of a lamp and the word of our testimony, not counting our life to death. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. He makes me white as snow. Number three, you speak of the goodness of the Lord. David stood before Goliath and said, the same God that delivered me from the hands of the bear, from the hands of the lion, he will deliver you into my hands. He was testifying of the goodness of the Lord in time past. Listen to this. Stop complaining. There is still a goodness of God in time past. Oh, you don't like certain mistakes and errors you made by yourself, but there is certain goodness of God in the time past. If you will think well, you will recall them. And that is a weapon in the place of prayer. I can stand and say, the same God that delivered me in the university when I thought there was no way out, he is able to do it again. The same God that gave me a child, when they said, where would the child come from? He is able to do it again. The same God that gave me a job, he is able to do it again. Be seated. Finally, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is very important. I was going to cost, I wasn't going to give you a phone. And finally, why should we be a praying church? So that we can fulfill the prophetic ministry of watchmen. Of watchmen. God has called every one of us into the ministry of watchmen. It's the high call of God for our lives. We must pray for others. Jesus prayed for his disciples. He told Peter, I prayed for you. The apostles didn't only do intercessory prayers. They asked for it also. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 21, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1. Paul said, pray for us. They demanded and they prayed for them. We are all watchmen of God. Stay by your altar and watch. 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 A watchman is a person who keeps guard. Listen, dear friends. Let us read Isaiah 62. No, let's read. Let's read Isaiah 3, 16 to 21. No, sorry, Ezekiel 3, 16 to 21. I think it's getting to me. Ezekiel 3, 16 to 21. Give me Ezekiel 3. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Continue. Wow. Let me read it myself. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Continue. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, for his blood I will require at your hand. Let's go to 33. Give me 33, 1 to 7. Do you know that in this church... Recently, someone was sick, or someone is sick, and then somebody, I was speaking to somebody, and I said, but I asked her, I saw her, and that's the watchman. See, I saw her, and she was sick, and I tried to contact her. I said, she's fine. The work of the watchman is to be on the guard. Nothing to get out of your family without you knowing. You are not a husband. Say, I'm the Lord of this house. I got Lord this responsibility. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of, Israel, of your people and say to them, When I bring this word upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. So what happens if they make him their watchman? When he sees the word, sword coming from the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people. That whoever hears the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and take him, it is left to him. 
What does that tell us? What does that tell us? Is that as a watchman, you see spiritually. You see things. You can only see when you rise above others. See only what they see in the, in the physical. You see spiritual stuff. You begin to tell them, that's wrong. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. We have to be careful. You've got to watch. And I want to close by giving you two verses of scriptures. Very important. Give me Isaiah 62, verse 6. Let me say this to you. When anything goes wrong in a spiritual environment, it is the God. Anything goes wrong in a spiritual environment, it is the God that have lost their ground. Watch, oh watchman. God for the destiny of others are dependent on you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You will make mention of the Lord. Do not keep silent. Do not keep silent. Are you a watchman over your family? Are you a watchman over that business? Are you a watchman over your house? God said, I have made you a watchman over this church. I have made you a watchman over that office. I have made you a watchman. Nobody should die under your guard. Not under my watch. Not under my watch. Not under my watch. Not under my watch. Give me 52 verse 8 of the same Isaiah. Not under my watch. Watchmen are sleeping. Evil is coming in. Because watchmen are sleeping. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. The Lord bringing back Zion is dependent on watchmen. Reviver is dependent on watchmen. Renewer is dependent on watchmen. Listen, dear friends. This is the oracle of God to his church. We only have blind watchmen who sees and hears nothing. People who cannot bark. They love to slumber, lying and dreaming. Yet evil comes and takes us by surprise because there are no guards. Until the church has amounts again the spiritual guards. A prophetic company of prayer was at the door. Will you advise a watchman? Will you take responsibility for your family? Will you take responsibility not just for your life, but for your business? Will you take responsibility for your generation? I was telling somebody yesterday, if people can hear it causes because of the lineage they came from, your children should receive blessings because they come through your lineage. It is what I do. It is what I say to them. Is I'm just a watchman. I've never given back to any child that God has not said it is time. I have never. I've never tried to make babies. I have never. Never. He says it and he does it. Am I saying that those who don't have babies are not? I'm saying, I'm talking to you about my life and my experience. I don't know what they know. I know what I know. You don't just get married by chance. You get married because you had a word from God. You can't just say, our family, things are not working. When we get to this stage, December, people get sick, and you have been a Christian for 15 years. You're a failure. I have no apologies. It's time to stand on your watch. Slumbered enough. You've lied to yourself enough. You're a warrior. He said they will see face to face. Did you see that verse? When Zion is returned. Are there Zions in this place? Are there people who know there is a returning coming? Are there people who know there is a revival coming? Are there people who want to be in that wind of God? I, 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 I may not be the face of that mighty revival. But I can say I was a part of a people who called for that mighty revival. I prayed on bended knees. I stayed that God will come. Revival does not mean a people falling down. It means a people returning to God. Will your family return to God because of you? I got born again and I pray for every member of my family. Every one of them is born again today. Every one of them. Every one of them. Every single one of them. Every one of them. Every single one of them. You take responsibility. Will you rise, ladies and gentlemen? Will you rise?
Israel, Moses stood and said, Arise, O Lord, and your enemies be scattered. Arise, O Lord, and your enemies be scattered. Arise, O Lord, arise. I want to say to you, will you arise that the enemies of your soul will be scattered? When you arise, believe. I want you to hold the person by your side. We just want to give attention to prayers for a few minutes. Hold the person. If you are watching online, if you have somebody you are watching, we just hold that person. The tangible presence of the Lord is in this place. And I just want you to raise your voice in the place of prayers. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. This is not the time where we form. You, if you want to break down in his presence, break down. Because <laughs> you see, that egopto, you can see clearly that this is what's going on. You know they need an instruction to break through to the next level. I'm going to pray in tongues loud and fast. Loud and fast. Can you begin to pray? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. There are on, <laughs> there are demons that are not sandelic. Open your mouth and pray. And Luve le Vrotila Prakosa. Endore, Endore Palita. Odolok Polipra Sotoi. When Zion prevailed, Zion brought forth. Epe, Epe. Adole Kaleto. Amro Shelia Kato Balada. Ebrade de de Frakotelia. Enzo Soso Baletaba. Oprate le Poye. Pare. Pare, oh no no photo, Adele koto, Abradele kata, oh do 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 lo do yo dosha, Abradele lo koto yo ko yo do bosh, Elo se le lo lo ko poloto, Abrato to bale ko poloto bo, Ayerosh, Ayerosh, Watchman, Watch of the night, Watchman. Watch of the day, watch man, watch of the day. Leo, leo, shaba. Ebra, de, 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 Watch man, watch of the night. You can break those hands if you want to. I want to pray three prayer points very quickly. I know our time is well spent. Three prayer points uh, very quickly. We'll come on Saturday and pray some more. And pray some more. But three prayer points very quickly. I want you to pray. It. The first one, you are going to say, you are going to speak to devils. Anything that is injuring you. Everything that is cutting into your part, every egopto of the devil against your progress. Is somebody praying? Is somebody praying? Every devil cutting you off for financial blessings, for relational blessings. Let them be cut off. Let them be cut off. Are you praying? Are you praying? Maro Satahe. Abratete Brataya Nabash. Oh, call your cut or 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 cut Every emotional hindrance, every emotional hindrance, a pole palata, a poro palita kata, a brat at the dead at the dead at the dosha, a brat at the dead at the dead at the dosha, a brat at the dead at the dead at the dosha. Oh, I break through and I break forth. I break through and I break forth. No more sorrow. 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 Every 
everything that hinders you. I unbound every demonic works that hinders you. Hey! Jesus, please. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. He makes me white as snow. Somebody here is pulling through. Somebody here is breaking through. With Jesus by your side. With the name of Jesus. With the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, And when Zion traveled, Zion brought forth. He brought forth. A second prayer point. You know when I showed you with Jesus by his side. With Jesus by his side. You are going, the Bible says in 12, 11 revelations, they overcame him. They overcame. They didn't, they overcame. That means they did not just broke through. They, the way they fell down, that's the way it's supposed to be. You overcome by the blood of a lamp and the word of their testimony. Listen, God told me this some minutes ago. He said, tell them, even if there were mistakes in your past, he said, my blood is sufficient. Even if there are mistakes in your past, the blood is sufficient. Even if there is mistake in the present, the blood is sufficient. By the blood, can you begin to break through? Oh, the blood. Oh, by the blood. I overcome by the blood of Jesus. I overcome by the blood of Jesus. I overcome. By the blood of Jesus, Meleso Pala Pale Posa, El Prate Tele Pale Posa, El Prate Tele Pale Pala Pas, El Prate Tele Pale Pala Pados, El Prate Tele Pale Bosa, El Daya 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 Davos, yes, Moto Polo Polo Posa, El Carecoto Posa, El Loco Notos, El Tete Colos, El Prate Lecopolos. Hey! Hey! The blood is sufficient for me. 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 The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Somebody say it. Say that the blood of Jesus is against you. Somebody say it. Say that the blood of Jesus is against you. Say that the blood of Jesus is against you. In my life, in my family, the blood of Jesus is against you. I pull up my shutter. Hey, they don't go for shutter. Yes. Thank you, Father. Jesus name I pray Amen. finally you want to tell of the goodness of God you want to tell of the goodness of God you know I love that song Lord you are good and your mercy is forever Amen Listen, don't bother about singing. Don't bother about singing. Now, finally, finally, your, the goodness of God in the life of us, Alan, is not his goodness in your life. There are things that are the same. Your life is a life. But there are things that are unique to only you. Right? Oh, but there are also things that are the same. Your biological dad is late. Yes, sir. Abby? Yes, sir. Your biological father, too, is late. Is it also? The same. Yes, 
Who has kept you this far? I know people under the sound of my voice. Wait, wait. Who have lost their husbands? But he's still faithful still. There are still some goodness of Jehovah in your pain. Can you? I don't want you to say, Jesus, I thank you. No. That is not being specific. You see, in the place of prayer, specificity determines dynamism. You have to be very specific. I want you to think when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my very soul shall shout, Hallelujah! 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 sick bear. They thought it was over. You raised me up. You raised me up. You sent me here. And look at the church you have given to yourself. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for every life represented in the hands of God. Thank you for every life in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for always giving us your word. Thank you.
understanding even when we didn't see you when we didn't know the way you took you are there at the times where we thought we needed your voice and we did not hear anything you gave us your embrace your sweet sweet presence in the times where it didn't pan out the way we thought it would pan out and many times we have come out of it all just complaining and being ungrateful where people who just who just always want more we are never never grateful for your goodness for your kindness for the things you did and you have kept you have kept doing thank you Allah they will go the one who is crowned with glory people call you up in way God, the one who sits in heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the small blessings. Thank you for health. Thank you for life. Thank you for family. Thank you for community. Thank you for friends. We didn't have it all and we don't have it all. Thank you for the blessings that came through our mistakes and our errors. You still work some blessings out. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll give you glory. Be kind wherever you are. Just lift your hands and just say thank you, Jesus. to do something this morning. You know, you should have like a sweet name, sweet name you call God that you really mean. If you don't have, it's a good place to just find one right now. One of the favorite names I love calling him is that Yahweh, the one that keeps covenants. I don't know what name you call God but I believe it is okay for you to call him that name right now. Will you just call him that name right now? If you have a song you sing to him, it's a good place to sing that song. Without the music helping you on, will you worship him? Your kind. 